Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful to see a full house for this uh, popular subject called Brexit. <laughs> And as you know, uh, from his background, he's Professor of European Politics and Foreign Affairs at King's College London. And his uh, particular interest to us, and he, one of his claims to fame, is that he directs this uh, uh, Economic and Social Research Council initiative in the UK, and U UK and changing Europe. So he's not just looking at Brexit, I think he's looking at uh, uh, the wider picture, but his life seems to be dominated by meetings. Uh, this is going to be an easy ride for him because on the 7th of March, he's on a panel with Ken Clark, Jess Phillips of Labour, Douglas Carswell, former UKIP, and Ian Paisley, <laughs> DUP. So wish, wish him luck for that evening. It only lasts an hour, uh, but I'm sure we're going to have a really uh, riveting time with uh, exploring all the issues uh, with Anand. And at the interval, he'll be at the uh, Blackwell's de desk uh, with his insightful book, Brexit and British Politics, so you can meet him there as well. But without further ado, let's have an update from Professor Anand Menon. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me again. Uh, it's great to be back. I've never done a lecture that was attached to selling a book before, so I feel suddenly a lot more nervous. <laughs> I also kind of recall the last time I was here, my closing comment rather glibly was, I'd be delighted to come back in a couple of years when this is all sorted. <laughs> so it kind of shows what I know. Uh, so I'm going to have another stab at being wrong this evening. Uh, and to try, perhaps rather ambitiously, to go through those various questions. What is happening at the moment? What might happen in Parliament over the next few weeks? What will the impact of whatever we decide be? What might our politics look like after Brexit? Which, of course, is brave, isn't it? Because I've got no idea what our politics might look like on Newsnight tonight, let alone... Uh... <laughs> and what the priorities for Britain after Brexit could and should be. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to aim for 45 minutes. Uh, if I end up, because I sometimes get overexcited at the start, and then we'll leave bits out to us towards the end. So don't hold me to that, but I'll do my best. So what's going on? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the simple questions, isn't it, that are impossible to answer. I mean, and, and the first thing to say, I think, is there are all sorts of different opinions about Brexit, about whether we should leave the European Union, remain in the European Union. There are perfectly valid arguments either way. There are very, very few valid arguments that I can see in favour of the proposition that Parliament has handled this well. Uh, and actually, one of the curious and rather sad features of Brexit is that in all the opinion polling we've seen carried out over the last six months, and it's a growing tendency, the one thing in a country that is looking ever more divided, the one thing on which people now agree is that our politicians are not fit for purpose, that po the politics isn't working. And actually, that might be true. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try and explain a little bit of the sort of dilemmas that face politicians in a minute, but I think it's a very, very dangerous situation, if nothing else, because if people have no faith in their politics, uh, it can lead to all, all, all types of sort of dysfunctionality when people vote. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a good state of affairs to be starting from. But anyway, let me turn back to what happened in Parliament. Was it only last week? Last week. God, doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Uh, last week was remarkable in so many ways. It was remarkable, firstly, because we had our Prime Minister claiming a victory when the deal that she had portrayed as being the only conceivable deal on the table was defeated. And she came back and said, that was a great victory. Uh, so that was strange. The second thing that was strange was what she claimed was a victory was the passing of an amendment that made her go back to Brussels and asked her to ask for something she'd been asking for for a year and which she'd failed to get. So basically, they sent her back to try again. And to date, and I'll talk about the backstop a little bit later on, 
the European Union have stuck to their answer. We're not reopening the withdrawal agreement, and even if we did, which we're not, we're not going to change the backstop. There seems to be very, very little prospect, rightly or wrongly, and you can query whether the EU has got this right, and I think you can have doubts about whether they've got this right, but rightly or wrongly, they're sticking to their guns. Third weird thing was the European Research Group basically fell in line behind this Brady Amendment for the renegotiation of the backstop, and within about 24 hours of it passing, started to disown it, saying, actually, it's not about the backstop. There are all sorts of other problems with this deal. So actually, even if the prime minister goes away and manages to achieve the thing that it doesn't look like she can achieve because they've already said no for the last 12 months, even if that happens, we're still going to vote against this deal because we've just decided there are some other things that we don't like about it as well. Okay. And only two more weird things that come to mind immediately. One weird thing is... At the basis of this thinking in the Conservative Party was this thing called the Malthouse Compromise, named after Kit Malthouse. And the point of this compromise was essentially to send the Prime Minister off in search of not one, but two wholly different unicorns. The first unicorn was the backstop. We'll get rid of it from the withdrawal agreement altogether. If you try hard enough, the European Union will accept that. Okay? I don't think that's going to happen. And the second unicorn was, and if you fail... What you need to do is go to the European Union and say, look, we're leaving without a deal, but you'd like, we'd like you to give us a nice transition period during which we can glide out in a less disruptive manner than if we just fell out with no deal. Now, the problem with that is twofold. One, the European Union has no interest in helping us in the event of no deal by giving us a transition period. The second and more serious point is there is no legal mechanism whereby the European Union can arrange for a transition period unless they do it as part of Article 50. And if we reject the withdrawal agreement, there is no deal under Article 50 at all. So Malthouse is based on a political misjudgment and a legal misunderstanding. So that is where Parliament put us. And in case you were saying to yourselves, well, that's all right, because there's always an opposition. <laughs> <laughs> the Labour amendment that was backed by the Labour front bench was to delay the process of Brexit, but we don't know why, because we can't agree on that. So essentially, that's where Parliament put us. Uh, it wasn't Parliament's finest hour. And actually, after all that blood and thunder that we saw in the chamber last week, by the time you got to Thursday night, the one thing that was absolutely clear was nothing at all of substance had changed. We were precisely in the same position we had been in when the initial vote was held earlier in January, when the initial vote was pulled back in December, Nothing of substance has moved at all. So I think one way to look at this, and one way to think about it, is to look at why this is happening in terms of the two political parties. And let me start with Labour. The Labour position on Brexit, to put it politely, is profoundly ambiguous. Okay? You can criticize the party for that, but I would say before you criticize the party for that, that you should take heed, because what is the point of a political party? It is to win power. I don't know if I showed you this slide last time or not. If you look at that, that is the constituencies in the 2017 election. The, chart, the lines show the change in vote share between the 2015 and the 2017 election. And the constituencies are arranged from the most remainy constituencies on the left to the most levy constituencies, I'm sorry for the technical language, <laughs> on the right. If you look at the red lines, it is a testament to the success of ambiguity. Because what Labour did in the 2017 election is they picked up vote share amongst leavers and remainers because no one knew what they meant essentially. So leavers could say they're going to respect the referendum, and remainers can say, well, they're not as Brexity as the Tories, so we quite like them. And it worked a charm. And that, ultimately, is the reason why the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn thought to themselves, we need to maintain this ambiguity, because in the event of a general election, we don't want to lose votes from either side. If you look at the Conservative line, uh, the blue line, the Conservatives only picked up vote share significantly in leave seats. So the Labour strategy works. If you're one of those people who thinks Brexit is the most important thing in the world, so the duty of any politician is either to make sure it happens or to stop it, you can say, well, Labour have got their priorities all wrong. They should be focusing on Brexit. If you're one of those people, and I suspect Jeremy Corbyn is one of these people, who thinks actually the priority, whatever happens with Brexit, is to have a Labour government, this makes a lot of sense. 
having a position that everyone can think of as sort of broadly in agreement with what I think, even if those positions are contradictory, works quite well. Now, the problem is that public opinion changes and that things move. Now, I won't go into too much detail on this. Basically, I'm going to show you two like this, but what you need to look at is the seats above the line are remain constituencies. The dots below the line, you've got to forgive me, Wakefield's on there because I'm from Wakefield and my office always sticks Wakefield on there because I think it's funny. Uh, <laughs> there are decent political science reasons for the other ones, which I won't bore you with, but Wakefield has no relevance apart from the fact that they put it on there. So what you will see there is these dots represent the key marginal constituencies, either that Labour wants to hold on to in red, in blue, or to win from the Conservatives in red. So these are seats with majorities of less than 5,000, okay? And what you'll see there is the majority of the marginal seats that Labour will be worried about in the next general election were leave seats. So being a little bit leavey with your ambiguity made sense back in 2017 when this, was, this chart was done. But if you look at this chart, these are the same constituencies in polling done in 2019, okay? So the point is, one of the reasons why Labour has apparently seen to soften its position on Brexit over the course of the last two years is because more of the target seats that it needs to hold on to or win to come to power are remain than they were back in 2017. I'll do my little technical trick here by that. You can see the dots move up, yeah? So the dots have become... The key constituencies have become more remaining. So there's a pressure on Jeremy Corbyn because of that from people like Keir Starmer to actually become more in favour of either a softer Brexit or no Brexit at all. And the final thing, this must be so frustrating for Jeremy Corbyn because his strategy works so well up to now, is if you look at this and you look at that top line, do you think the Labour Party's policy on Brexit is clear or unclear? That top line is fairly or completely unclear and confusing. And so people are starting to get irritated with the Labour position on Brexit now. It worked for a certain amount of time, but increasingly it is starting to make people think, well, what do they stand for? What do they mean? So there is enormous pressure on Jeremy Corbyn to clarify that position and to clarify it in a more remainy direction. I suspect he'll hold a line. I suspect he'll hold a line for a number of reasons. Uh, not least because in Labour High Command there is still a fear that if you, if you lose the Leave voters, you can never win a general election because there are so many northern target seats that are full of Leave voters. I'm not sure that's true, but I think it's what the Labour Party thinks. On the other side of the aisle, we have the Tories. Now here, the interesting story about the Tories, I think, is the difference between Tory members and Tory voters on the one hand and Tory members and Tory MPs on the other. So, the green, well, whatever colour that is, the sort of greeny colour means you oppose May's deal, the black means you support May's deal. So what you see there is opposition to May's deal is least strong amongst Tory voters and it is pretty strong amongst Tory members and most strong amongst Tory backbench MPs. So the party is divided and increasingly alienating its voters, which is a problem a massive problem for any political party. It becomes more of a problem if you look at the numbers on this. This is, imagine Brexit ended up, Britain ended up leaving without any deal. How would you feel? Look at the Conservatives on that. 
And the thing about that is, if you aspire to be the next leader of the Conservative Party, that is your electorate. Because the second round of the Tory leadership election is a vote amongst the membership. So there are several things going on in the Conservative Party at the moment. Firstly, I think there are some people in the Parliamentary Conservative Party who genuinely think no deal will be fine. I don't think there's more than about 10 or 12 of them. Then you have a far larger number who are going around saying they think it will be fine, even if they don't believe it, because I suspect for those people, they want us to get the deal. They want this deal to go through, but they also want to be on record saying, I want no deal, because when, if and when the leadership contest comes after we've left the European Union, they want to be able to point to that speech and say, yeah, I was a fan of no deal, but the Prime Minister undermined me. All right, so there are lots of different games going on at par in Parliament at the moment, which means that actually it's very, very hard for anything like a coherent... I mean, it's very hard to get a coherent position within each of the parties, let alone across the benches in Parliament as a whole, because people are struggling with so many different things. And, of course, on top of all of this, and it's, it's, it's hard to explain this, but it's really, really important not to downplay it, Brexit divides the parties immensely, internally, okay? But there is also, amongst MPs, a very powerful pull towards party loyalty. I was poking fun at the Malthouse compromise earlier, uh, the Tory party back, is a, a lot of backers across Leavers and Remainers in the Conservative Party. The Brady Amendment passed with the support of Conservative MPs. Why? Well, one reason why is it was an excuse for them to vote together. The party came together again. I don't know if you watched on the television uh, when the vote of no confidence happened in Parliament and the debate in Parliament. The most striking thing about that for me was the sight of people like Dominic Grieve and Anna Soubry reveling in the fact that they were back in the club. They were attacking Corbyn, they were together with their conservative friends, the party was unified again. So at the same time, there is a tremendous pull towards party unity. So on the conservative side, it pulls people like Nicky Morgan, who you might think of as something of a Remainer, towards supporting the Brady Amendment and the Malthouse Compromise because she wants to drag the party back together again. On the Labour side, it's even more insidious in some ways because Labour's position on Brexit and Theresa May's, Bre Theresa, May, Theresa May's Brexit deal is we don't have any real problems with the deal, but we want a customs union. Okay, I mean, I simplify slightly. We can go into more detail if you want. The irony of the, of the Labour Brexit position is you can have a customs union with this deal. There is nothing at all in the deal that Theresa May has negotiated that precludes us being in a permanent customs union in the future. In fact, some people would argue that the infamous Irish backstop is a customs union, so we will be in a customs union under the Theresa, May, Theresa May's deal, whether you like it or not. In fact, one of the reasons why so many Tories dislike the deal is because of the customs union that Labour say they want that Theresa May has actually negotiated. So, but the point about that is, this is political. Ultimately, the Labour Party opposes Theresa May's deal because it's Theresa May's deal. It's a Tory deal. And I suspect if you want to be cynical, it's up to you, you might look at the current front bench of the Labour Party and think what these people want is the following. They want Brexit out of the way. They want this deal to go through. They probably want a small economic hit to the country that makes everyone dislike the Conservatives, but they don't want their fingerprints anywhere near it. Okay? And that is the game that's being played at the moment. It is, if you like, in Parliament, and I'll come back to this later on, there is a very sophisticated, or many very sophisticated games of plausible deniability going on. Wasn't me, Gov, is something we will hear a lot of when, if, we emerge out of the other side of this. So, what happens next? Remarkably, for a deal that A, wasn't voted on because they knew they were going to lose, two, was voted on and got thrashed by 230 votes, the deal lives on. And the deal lives on for several reasons, not least because it is the only deal on the table and the European Union keeps saying until they're blue in the face, we're not negotiating another one. We can mess around with the non-binding political declaration, if you like, but the withdrawal agreement is the withdrawal agreement and we are not going to reopen that. So the Prime Minister's tactic is perfectly clear. She will, and there were sources in Brussels yesterday saying the Brits came over to Brussels and pretended to negotiate. She will run down the clock, okay? And if you run down the clock, what happens is Parliament faces the stark choice between this deal, leaving with no deal, or if you're a Brexiter and this is your fear, 
the fact that if we get close to no deal, sufficient numbers of parliamentarians might vote in favor of a referendum to prevent it. So we move towards that threefold choice. And Theresa May's calculation, and I think she's possibly right here, I don't know for a fact, is as that threefold choice crystallizes in the minds of MPs, she will get the majority she needs for her deal. Because her deal might not be very popular, but it's a lot more popular than no deal, and all the evidence suggests it's also significantly more popular than the idea of another referendum amongst MPs. So she's playing chicken with Parliament, if you like. And each party will face difficult choices, not least the DUP, because the DUP find themselves in a situation where they're opposing a deal that virtually the whole of Northern Ireland really likes. This deal is great, and it's popular in Northern Ireland. Why? Because it prevents a border. Because it allows Northern Ireland to keep on trading as it does now, not only with us, but also with the European Union. The farmers in Northern Ireland support it, big DUP supporters. The CBI in Northern Ireland have come out in favor of this deal. The DUP are alienating their community, and they are starting to have second thoughts. So they will face a conundrum. Do we maintain our opposition to this? Because remember, if we leave with no deal, there is polling that suggests, in the event of no deal, there will be a majority in Northern Ireland in favor of unification with the Republic. That is the DUP's worst nightmare. Okay. So over the next week or two, there will be some very, very hard decisions to be made by the DUP. And the DUP are absolutely fundamental to this. Because if the DUP decide they can live with the backstop, and decide either to vote for the deal or to abstain, it's very hard for Conservative MPs to say, I can't vote for this deal on principle because of Northern Ireland. It makes you look, and this is a really bad phrase to use with the DUP, but it's quite apposite, it'll make you look more Catholic than the Pope. The DUP are happy with the backstop, but Tory English MPs are saying, no, 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 because of what it does to Northern Ireland. It's a weird position. So if the DUP flip, they will bring a load of Tories with them. And actually, inside the European Research Group, we're no longer sure how many of these people will vote against the deal no matter what. My bet will be no more than 20 if she gets some progress on the backstop and if the DUP come over. And they're big ifs. I'm not saying it will happen. But the other thing that will happen is a load of Labour MPs who are terrified of no deal but also really do not want another referendum will ultimately either back the deal or abstain on it. And so it is at least conceivable that Theresa May's deal is going to go through, unless, this is the one final thing I want to say about this boring parliamentary stuff, the Cooper Amendment goes through next week, which changes the game because the Cooper Amendment, to cut a very complicated story very short, essentially pushes us towards delaying the date of leaving the European Union. And if we delay the late date of Euro leaving the European Union, that gun to the head of an imminent no-deal exit disappears, and it takes the pressure off MPs. If the Cooper Amendment passes next week, it is a game-changer for Theresa May's strategy. And so the priority in number 10 at the moment is ensuring that the Cooper Amendment doesn't go through. So if you're watching Parliament on, I think, Wednesday next week, that's the thing to watch. It's not the vote on the motion, it's the vote on the Cooper Amendment, because that could end up being a game-changer. Right, quite enough of Parliament. Let me just talk very, very briefly about what are the alternatives to a deal? Well, one is delay, like I said, via the Cooper Amendment. It's worth being absolutely clear about this. Delay solves absolutely nothing. This is just prevarication. This is simply saying we can't make up our minds now, so we'll just push it down the road a bit and something might turn up. Okay? The other thing about delay is it's far from certain the European Union will allow us to extend Article 50 just because we can't figure ourselves out. What the European Union have said quite clearly up to now, they might change their minds, this might be a bluff, but this is what they've said, is we will give you an extension if it's for a reason. We're not that keen on giving you an extension so we can watch your parliament do this over and over and over again. So you've got to show us some signs of progress. If you're going to have a general election, fine, we'll give you an extension. If you want to have a referendum, fine, we could think about giving you an extension. If you've got a few technical bits and bobs to sort out after passing the withdrawal agreement, perfect, we'll give you an extension. But if you come to us and say, look, we have no idea what you want, can we have some more time? Our question will be why. What's in it for us? What's the point? We're simply delaying the inevitable of you crashing out with no deal. So, delay is not necessarily a great tactic. A general election, we would get an extension for. I'm pretty confident about that. The problem with a general election is, and I can talk maybe in questions about this new independent MPs, because I don't really think they changed the calculus of Brexit, because they were all going to vote against the deal anyway. 
If we get a general election, chances are nothing changes because there, is, there seems no obvious way either of the big parties can gain a majority. You might actually end up exactly back where we are now with a minority Conservative government. You might have a minority Labour government. We don't know, but it's, both parties will stand on a manifesto almost certainly of respecting the outcome of the referendum. So it's not a Brexit game changer in the sense that, you know, we'll reconvene after the election and sit down with the withdrawal agreement and say, right, now what? So nothing will move on. So in a sense, we're talking about the three options. We're talking about no deal, no Brexit, or Theresa May's deal. No deal, which is a disorderly Brexit in the language of the Bank of England, these are forecasts, taken with a pinch of salt. They're forecast by serious economists. It's not project fair. They haven't made it up. I mean, you can look at the way they work this out. No deal will be tremendously disruptive in the short and medium term for the simple reason that what leaving the European Union with no deal means is that all the laws that govern how we trade with Europe, how we travel to Europe, how we do security with Europe, all those laws will cease to exist on our statute books because they're EU laws that govern our interactions. And so at a minimum, there will be enormous amounts of uncertainty. The, the body that certifies planes as safe to fly in Europe is an EU body. Uh, the Europeans have to agree to mutually recognize driving qualifications, and they haven't yet. So your driving license won't work after no deal unless they come to some sort of deal. Now, maybe they'll come to some sort of deal. The fact is, that scale of disruption uncertainty about tariffs, uncertainty about checks at borders until people figure out what to do is going to have an impact on all aspects of life that are interlinked between ours and theirs. And believe me, lots of aspects of this country's life are very intertwined with the European Union after 40 years of membership. No deal isn't like... People use the analogy of, of trading in your car for no deal. So like, I drive to the garage to trade in my car. The guy in the garage is a bit of a mean sod and he won't give me a decent deal. So I drive my car home again. That's no deal. No, it's not. No deal in this sense is you drive your car to the garage to trade it in. The guy offers you a deal that you don't really like. You start driving your old car home and it explodes and no longer works anymore. All right. The point about no deal in the EU situation is you do not revert back to the situation before. You revert back to something far worse. Okay? So no deal will be disruptive. The second option, then, is a referendum. Now, ah, this is on two slides now rather than one. You see how I remembered? That's very effective. Just, uh, this is a really, actually, this is messy now because it's on two slides. This is a hog, so I'm blaming you for this slide being no good. Uh, look at the right hand most column. This is what people who voted leave think about the idea of a number of different sorts of referendum. Okay? They are least opposed to the one at the top, which is the public having the final vote on Brexit. Okay? But if you go all the way down, I'll tell you what the point of this is in a minute, because it'll take us all evening for everyone to read that. Down at the bottom is 70, which is a new referendum on whether Britain should leave the European Union or remain a member. The British public are very unclear as to whether or not they want a referendum, and basically what determines their, their answer to the question is two things. One, if you use the word referendum, people don't like it. It's the Brenda from Bristol. Jesus, not that again, right? <laughs> and if remain is an option, they don't like it. The only way you get majority support in a poll for asking people if they want another vote is to call it a people's vote and not mention that Remain is an option. I.e., the only way you get majority support for a referendum amongst public opinion in this country is if leavers like the idea. And leavers don't want to vote Remain. They've done that. They voted against it already. And they like the idea of a people's vote because that means the people versus parliament. And they don't trust parliament on Brexit. Okay, so the first thing to bear in mind is it is far from clear that the British people have an appetite for a referendum. And it's far from clear if they do that Remain should be an option as far as they're concerned because for a surprising number of people, we've done that. No, actually not a surprising number of people because they're right. For a predictably large number of people, it's like we've already voted on that. So there is, there is significant support in public opinion for a referendum that is Mrs. May's deal versus no deal. And they're your binary options, Okay. Second thing I would say about a referendum is 
Now, this is interesting because, of course, if you remember during the referendum campaign, the, leave ca the Remain campaign centered on claims of economic damage. These are the people, you know, there's a growing number of people who think that the economy will be worse off because of Brexit, okay? More and more leavers now think the economy will be worse off because of Brexit. If you follow the logic of the Remain campaign, that means they'll be changing their minds, but actually, if you look at those top two lines, whether it was the right or wrong decision to leave the European Union, there has been a slight shift towards Remain, or wrong decision from right decision, and there has been a slight move from leave to remain, but the majority of the movement we've seen in those two lines has come about because of people who either didn't vote in 2016 because they were lazy, or couldn't vote in 2016 because they were too young, now saying they would vote remain. So actually, there is very, very limited evidence of people having changed their minds. So, first thing I would say about a referendum is, not necessarily a popular thing to do, we have no idea who would win a referendum. And that's without the practicalities. To get a referendum, Parliament is going to have to pass a bit of legislation mandating a referendum. There is no such majority at the moment. There might be if the choice becomes a binary one between a referendum and no deal. If Theresa May's deal dies again, it's possible. But at the moment, there's no majority. Then, Parliament has to agree, agree on the question. Is it the deal versus no deal? Is it remain versus no deal? Is it remain versus the deal? Is it all three of them with standard transferable votes so you can have preferences and then stick it through to the second round? Is it two referendums? We have leave remain one Thursday, and then if we vote to leave, we have deal versus no deal the next Thursday. I'd like to see the turnout on the second Thursday, I have to say. <laughs> And assume Parliament sorts all that out, because Parliament obviously is very decisive nowadays. <laughs> Moving on, we have a referendum campaign, which I think will be pretty damaging to our politics, because one half of the referendum campaign will be, you can't trust the bastards. I mean, that is what the campaign will be. The Leave camp have already got their slogan, and their slogan is, tell them again. Okay? That, I think, will be quite damaging for politics in any country to have to sit through a referendum like that. And then... Even imagine, after all this, we get to the point, we have the referendum, and imagine we vote to remain by, I don't know, 51-49 on a slightly lower turnout than 2016, which is perfectly possible. Does that solve this? No, we're back where we started from. The Tory party's divided over Europe. Nigel's back with a new political party polling in the 20%. We will have woken up in 2012 again. It's the world as it was for David Cameron. The Europe issue is tearing the Tories apart. So it might yet be that Parliament doesn't handle this well and we end up in a situation where a referendum looks like a viable alternative to anything else we have to choose from. But don't for a moment assume it's going to be easy or it's going to solve very much because it will be difficult and it will cause as many problems as it resolves. Which leaves us with May's deal. Let me talk to you briefly about what this deal will mean for the UK. Again, what we have to go on are economic forecasts. I talked to you last time about economic forecasts, and I won't repeat what I said, but I think these longer-term trade forecasts are far more reliable than the short-term forecasts that the Treasury issued in April 2017. But in aggregate, te in aggregate terms, there is no doubt... If you look at the two, the ones on the left are under a deal, best and worst case. The other is with no deal, best and worst case. And the hit to the economy under deal is less bad than no deal. So... Having Theresa May's deal is less damaging to the economy than not having Theresa May's deal. Why? Because at heart, if you really, really simplify it, Brexit, and there are, as I said, there are very good reasons to want Brexit. I don't think they are necessarily short-term economic ones. There are good political reasons for wanting to leave the European Union. But Brexit as a process is about making trade with your largest and nearest trading partner more difficult. Okay, that's ultimately what we are doing. Okay, we might be good reasons, it might be the right thing to do, it might be a, a price worth paying for sovereignty, that's a perfectly legitimate argument, or to reduce immigration or whatever, but let's be honest about what we're doing. We're making trade harder with the people we trade most with. And if you make trade harder with the people you trade most with, it has an impact on your economy. The other thing I would say is if you make trade harder with your nearest and largest trading partner, it is incredibly unlikely you can make that up by trading with people thousands of miles away. Because this might be the 21st century, and we might have email, but actually every single empirical study of trade patterns shows that there is a strong 
and continuing correlation between trade and geography. Countries trade disproportionately more with, con with countries closer to them. And yes, the Brexiters were absolutely right. Asia is growing much, much faster than Europe. Okay? But short of rowing ourselves round there as an island, <laughs> right? We are not going to make cars with China because shifting the stuff to and fro is going to take too long and be too unreliable. Geography still matters. So you're still tied to your... You are stuck with your neighbors. It's like family. You're stuck with your neighbors because trade with them is easier. Commerce is easier. If you want to practice law in another country, you'd rather pop over to France than have to do a long haul to Shanghai uh, if you were doing it regularly. So geography matters. So ultimately, trade is going to decrease. And then let's think about what that means. There's two ways of thinking about that. What, what that means. Firstly, and I'm sorry, this is a dreadful picture. If I was technologically gifted, I would have just had the UK there. But the darker the green is, the larger the impact of Brexit. And this is essentially a map that shows how dependent different regions are on trade with the European Union. And the irony here is, the more strongly you voted leave, chances are the more dependent your region is on, tr on trade with the European Union. The two parts of the United Kingdom least dependent on trade with the European Union are London and Scotland, the two parts of the United Kingdom that most strongly voted to remain. So the picture is going to be a disproportionately regional one. The West Midlands gets very, very badly hit. The North East gets very, very badly hit because they're the parts of the country where trade is focused on Europe, and there's a lot of manufacturing that goes to and fro between here and Europe. Again, these are forecasts. They're not, they're not predictions. It's not science. These are just a best guess from people who've studied economics. Okay? What does this mean? Now, the first thing to say is this is not a cliff edge. Our economy is not going to collapse. In fact, all the estimates of Theresa May's deal into the future are our economy will keep on growing. We're not, going to simp we're not going to suddenly tumble into recession. The economy will continue to grow. It won't grow as fast as it would have done. Which matters. The numbers are big. But politically, it's quite subtle. People won't suddenly wake up and say, oh my God, where's everything gone? Because the economy will still be going all right. A cliff edge is a fundamentally misleading metaphor for Brexit. I think a better metaphor for Brexit is actually a slow puncture. All right? So I don't know if you cycle, right? You get a slow puncture. There are two things that are notable about a slow puncture. Firstly, it takes you absolutely yonks to figure out you've got one. Because whenever I get a slow puncture, I think, oh my God, my legs are going. That's the first thing I think. For a couple of weeks, I think, oh God, age is catching up with me. I can't pedal anymore. All right, and then you think, oh God, I've got a slow puncture. But the second thing about a slow, so this is a, this is a process that will work out over years, probably before it suddenly we, we think, hmm, things aren't quite as good here as we might have expected. But it won't be sudden, and there won't be a massive political shock. The second thing about a slow puncture, it's worth bearing in mind, is when you realize you've got one, you have no earthly clue where you got it, all right, or when you got it. And that's the other thing about this. The Brexit impact. I mean, a lot of Remainers say, oh, once we've left, all those stupid leavers will realize they were wrong because the economy will crash and they'll all come back begging for another referendum. No, they won't. One, because uh, many of the reasons for leaving the European Union have nothing to do with economics anyway, and they're perfectly good reasons, so people aren't necessarily going to change their minds. All the studies show that a lot of leavers are very happy to pay an economic cost because this is political. And secondly, because there's going to be no sudden impact. So we will just keep on going. It's not the, Brexit isn't the end of the world. You hear people talking about Brexit as if it was sort of civil war or something like that. Brexit isn't the end of the world. We will still be a rich country. We will still have a large economy. It is just compared to the, hyper, the counterfactual of being in the single market and the customs union, it'll be a different sort of economy. Okay? So we have this slow puncture going on, and then very, very quickly, because I have drawled on, for which I apologize, I want to talk briefly, partly because this is what I'm interested in, really, uh, about politics after Brexit. We have a new identity in British politics, and it's a leave-remain identity. More people identify as leave or remain than identify as conservative or labor. It's a new division in our society. Now, there are many questions about this, one of which is, 
how long will this go on for? If we leave the European Union on the 29th of March, we can talk about it in questions we almost certainly won't, I should say, but if we do, not because we're not going to leave, but because we won't have anything, everything done by the 29th of March. This is why I take too long, because I do parentheses that go on for about 15 minutes. Uh, we have these new identities in British politics. We don't know how long they'll last. Will Remainers continue to get really worked up about this once we're no longer member states? Will those blokes with beards and flags on College Green remain there forever until they get hyperthermia, or will they go home? I mean, we don't know. But if it persists, it's important and it really matters because it's incredibly disruptive for our politics because our politics is structured at the moment by left versus right. Parties on the left, parties versus right. Some odd parties like UKIP and the Lib Dems that don't really fit that mould, but the big parties are left versus right. This is Brexit. Social liberals on the left, social conservatives on the right. Probability of voting leave as you go higher up goes up. Social conservatives voted for Brexit, social liberals voted Remain. That is the Brexit divide. And the reason why it's so disruptive and the reason why it splits the parties down the middle is the Conservatives and the Labour, and the Labour Party both, con both contain social liberals and social conservatives. So it's very, very hard for our parties to digest this new division. If you want a simple analogy, this is a bit like what the Americans call their culture wars. It's the values thing, this. This isn't about economic redistribution, how much you tax people, what is the role of the state in the economy. It's about, do you support the death penalty? Should criminals be locked up? Should children be disciplined? What are your positions on gay rights, on uh, gender equality? This is the division that is activated by Brexit. And it messes things up a bit in terms of our politics. This new group of independents in Parliament, largely social, well, all socially liberal people, are hoping to make a Remainer identity, something in politics now, their fate will hinge to a long, large extent on whether or not this Brexit identity persists into the future. I don't know. They don't know. It's something we're going to have to watch very carefully. 2017 election was interesting because you saw signs of the Brexit divide infecting politics because you saw the Conservatives increasing significantly their share of the working class vote, which isn't meant to happen. You saw the Conservatives winning Mansfield. You saw Labour winning Canterbury and Kensington. That isn't about social class. That's about social values. And if that continues, then it causes all sorts of problems for our parties because, you know, to put it simply, our parties no longer know who they're for if the social bases of politics are changing in the way they do. But for the moment... The problem we have in politics is nothing is going to crystallize and no one is talking about anything but Brexit. And when they're talking about Brexit, all that anyone wants to do is wipe their hands of this mess. As I said earlier on, now we live in the politics of plausible deniability. For the Labour, you let Tories take us out and blame them for any economic pain that comes out of it. For Tories, you say you hate this deal and you reluctantly vote for it because of party loyalty. Whichever way this goes, we are setting ourselves up for, imagine May's deal passes, we are setting ourselves up for years and years of retribution and recrimination because this will be a deal that no one ever said they liked, that got through Parliament because a gun of no deal was being held to their heads, and we will reopen the dossier as soon as we leave, which means that that, I suspect, is going to continue to haunt our politics and lead to political instability for the foreseeable future. Fear not, this is my last slide. The pernicious thing about Brexit is it gets in the way of the things that really, really matter. Okay? If you think about the last two years, three years, God, last three years, we haven't been governed. Virtually no laws have been passed. No one has talked about the big issues that we need to address, whether it's social care, whether it's skills, whether it's education. One of the reasons for that is what I was just talking about. Until the parties have it clear in their heads who their electorate is, they don't know what to say. I mean, if Labour's focus is on, main is on retaining Kensington, that calls for a slightly different approach to politics than if your priority is to retake Mansfield. All right. So you need to decide where your priorities lie before you decide what your policies are, and that's one of the reasons why the parties are hesitant. But I think in whatever we do going forward, the most important single thing is to remember where we're coming from and remember 
what the referendum was about. It was partly about membership of the European Union, absolutely. But it was partly driven, particularly in terms of driving those 2.8 million voters who didn't vote in 2015 but voted in 2016. In driving them to vote, it was about far broader dissatisfaction than simply unhappiness with EU membership. This is one of the things that lay behind it. The top line are, that is the disposable income of the top remain voting uh, areas, and the blue line at the bottom is the disposable income over time of the Leave voting areas. It is not as simple as this, okay? Prosperous areas voted Brexit, relatively poor areas voted uh, Remain. But there is something to this argument that there is an economic division at work here as well. Brexit was partly a reaction against what was seen as the dysfunctionality of our politics and of our economy. Okay, and that's what we need to think about going forward. Because ultimately, the proof of the Brexit pudding, if I can put it that way, is not what kind of trade deal do we get with the European Union. The British public aren't sitting at home thinking, oh God, I hope it's Canada and not Norway, but maybe with a bit of Switzerland thrown in on you know, services. They're thinking, sort the bleeding country out. Okay, And the things that bothered them over the last decade and came to the fore during the referendum campaign were domestic things that Brexit might shape because it shapes the macro economy, but apart from that, it won't at all. There was a very good report done about four or five months ago about poverty and Brexit, and the conclusion was fairly stark. We can do Brexit, we cannot do Brexit. Poverty in the UK is going to keep on rising. Why? Because it's government policies that drive poverty. It's housing benefit, it's a welfare. You could change those whether you do Brexit or not. Who is in power and what they do is ultimately going to be the determinant of what happens in this country and who is affected. So let's think about the things. And there's some really interesting things come out of the referendum. One is this. Since the referendum, we have become a lot more positive as a country about immigration. The two lines, the black one is the people who are positive about the economic impact of immigration. The other line, perhaps more surprisingly, are the people who are positive about the cultural impact of immigration. And this polling has been consistent since June 2016. The British are less bothered about immigration than they were in June 2016, and they're more positive about it as well. We could have an interesting policy debate about immigration now if someone was governing us. And we could talk about what sort of immigration policy we need in a sensible, rational, non-hysterical way. Other things that came to the fore in the referendum were the regional disparities in the way that some of the northern towns in particular voted overwhelmingly to leave. To, to leave. If you look at that, you see a disproportionate picture in which London does rather well, and the rest of the country, in terms of gross value added per head, in terms of economic performance, measured rather crudely, have done. These are the kind of things we need to be thinking about going forward. These are the sort of things we need to be addressing. We live in a country where, if you go into a typical British school classroom of 30 kids, Nine of those kids are living in poverty. We live in a country where homelessness has gone up 169% since 2010. The ultimate tragedy, the ultimate betrayal of the Brexit vote, it seems to me, is not about what we negotiate with Brussels. We're leaving, okay? Negotiate a deal and move on. But it'll be whether or not we address those genuine ills and discontent that stemmed as much from our own mismanagement of our country as from anyone else's interference in our country, but so be it and we fail to address those fundamental issues moving forward. And the sad thing now is, one of the best things, and I remember saying this to you back when I lectured last time, one of the best things about the referendum, and there were loads of good things about the referendum, I think, is that it re-energized people about politics. Interest in and participation in politics shot up. People were talking about politics. People still are to a remarkable degree, actually. I spend a lot of time traveling around the country, and people are talking about politics and interested in it. A recent Comrades poll. Parliament is emerging from Brexit in a good light. That line is a disagree line on the far left. As I said when I started off, the sad thing about the tale of Brexit is the one thing that these leavers and remainers so divided by values and everything else can agree on is that Parliament and politics is letting us down. And that, for me, is the thing that ultimately, going forward over the next couple of years, we really need to address. Brexit posed a number of questions about how we left the Uni European Union, sure, but about how we need to govern ourselves and govern our economy more effectively and more fairly in the future. It, w 
it was a revolution in the sense that it was a, a fundamental questioning of the basis of our system. And I think moving forward, the challenge that faces politicians that they haven't even started talking about, let alone about acting on, is whether they can rise to the challenge of that revolution and address some of those issues that led people to be so dissatisfied in the first place. And then in 10 years' time, we can look back on Brexit and say, yeah, it was hard, it was difficult, but it led us to be aware of the things we needed to address and we addressed them. I'm very doubtful this will happen, but I'm going to keep on being optimistic whenever I come and talk to you a lot. Thank you. I'm going to start with some of the questions on the table. And actually, the first one's a compliment. Jane Massey says she's been waiting since 2016 for the media to explain all aspects of <laughs> this decision to hold a referendum and they all the consequences and she thinks you've managed to explain it all in 45 minutes. Oh, that's very kind. So she wonders whether you've thought about a... Oh. <laughs> so she wonders whether you've thought about a career in the media. <laughs> you see, you can't tell if I'm going red. You can't see it on me, so... so. <laughs> now, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to talk a bit about Europe first. And uh, can I read out all the... All yeah. the there are four questions, but they're all sort of uh, in the same ballpark, if you could give us sort of one answer. Uh, so Michael Saxton uh, says, you didn't mention the state of EU economics, Italy in recession, Germany only just out of recession, as is France. Should these uh, factors be considered in uh, forecasting uh, what's, uh, what's going to happen with Brexit? Sylvia Rowe, with all the problems in the EU, Italy, Greece, Spain, she mentions, mm -hmm. uh, surely we should be better getting out with no deal. What do you think about that? Then we could sort things out. When, once we're out and can forget about all their problems, uh, maybe we can sort things out better, as you were suggesting. Uh, Vijay Menon, uh, a namesake, what will be the impact of Brexit on Europe over the next few years? Uh, Mike Hill, we saw a slide in the economic forecasts. Uh, that you had a slide up, didn't you? Yep. The economic forecast, the impact on the UK. Uh, he says that the EU probably have similar forecasts. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what, what do these show? And who, who will fare the best, uh, whether we're in or out? Okay. Uh, in almost reverse order. So Vijay's question, what I'd say is Brexit will have an impact. It'll have an economic impact, and it'll have an impact on the EU's influence in the world because we're one of the biggest member states. We're a permanent member of the Security Council, some of the best armed forces. The EU will be weaker without us. Uh, necessarily. I don't think other member states will follow us out of the door for a variety of reasons. I don't think there's any appetite for that. Nor do I think the EU is going to rush ahead and become a federation without us. I mean, the myth that Britain blocked the EU becoming something more than it is now was just that, a myth. So I think the EU will be weaker, but nothing dramatic will happen. On the no deal, yes, there are all sorts of problems in the European Union, most of them associated with the Eurozone. Uh, so they don't directly impact us. So, for instance, we're not affected by bailouts in the Eurozone or anything like that. The deal-no-deal no deal argument isn't a, deal, isn't, a, isn't, a, isn't a conversation about Brexit, in my view. It's a conversation about how you do Brexit. And I tend to think that doing it in an orderly fashion to minimize disruption for all those people who trade across the borders, who travel across the borders, who might be ending up sitting in lorries if we don't organize the right number of freight passes, it is better to do it in such a way as to minimize disruption to those people rather than doing it as a sort of short, short shock. Because it, it will affect people. Because, you know, if only think about the pensioner in Spain who suddenly loses the right of access to Spanish health care under no deal. Yeah, it might be that we'll strike a deal within a couple of months and it'll be sorted out. But they face tremendous sort of worry and anxiety in the interim. So if only at the human level, I, you know, we voted to leave, that's fine. I suspect, I think I'm pretty certain that we will end up leaving. But I'd rather we did it in an orderly way because otherwise real people with real lives get affected. So this isn't about governments. This is about 
people because there are people, you know, the car industry will, will need time to adapt because at the moment, you know, car, cars made in Europe, some of the parts cross the channel four, five, six times. If there are checks, if there are tariffs, they have to reinvent that model. I'm not saying they can't, and I'm not saying they won't, but I'm saying if you suddenly do the shock, it will have a massively disruptive impact. On the EU economy, you're absolutely right, and in fact, a German think tank last week published some figures that showed a no-deal Brexit would mean the difference between no recession and recession in Germany. A no-deal Brexit would drive Germany into recession. Uh, the impact of no deal on our closest European trading partners, Ireland first, then the Dutch, the Belgians, the French, the Germans, will be severe. At the moment, their position seems to be, you can call this principled, you can call this pig-headed, whichever you prefer, we are not willing to make exceptions for Britain, even if it involves a degree of economic pain for ourselves. Okay, And that seems to be the position they're adopting. Yep, no deal would be bad for us but it would be worse for us if we were seen to renege on our promises to the Irish and to get rid of the backstop, if that's the choice. So they're saying that. What I think might be damaging down the line, if we leave with no deal, I can imagine the unity that the EU has maintained up to this point being very, very sorely tested, because the first thing that will happen is precisely those states that trade most with us will, A, be demanding special mitigation measures from the Commission saying we need a new rule, we need to negotiate a rule with the Brits to keep the ferries flowing. The 30 odd thousand French freight drivers who cross the channel in their lorries will be saying we want special dispensation. So there'll be a lot of pressure from those states to come to deals with us, which will put pressure on the European Union. And all those countries will turn around to Brussels and say, and we'd like some financial contribution, please, because we're suffering this hit because of our principal stance on Brexit. And I think that is potentially dangerous because Brussels won't be writing checks for anyone anytime soon, and there are European elections in May. And I think the short-term political implications of a messy, bad-tempered, costly no-deal will be quite severe in continental Europe as well as here. I'd like to, before we take uh, the first question from the, uh, from the microphone, I'd like you to reflect on this interesting question. Uh, this member says that the press implies that the UK have given away a lot in the negotiations. It's a what have the Romans done for us type question. So he's saying, have the EU given us anything in return? Or has it just <laughs> been a... Uh, it, it, what, it, is the perception the press gives that it's been one way correct? Or do you see it differently? You see, this is totally weird because... So this is a question about the withdrawal agreement, OK? I'm an academic, so I'm one of those people. I looked at the withdrawal agreement. I just think it's a thing of beauty, which doesn't mean I think it's good or bad. I just think as a piece of legal craftsmanship that essentially squares the circle between our red lines and their red lines and creates some sort of compromise between leaving but keeping on trading, separating but keeping close, it is just a masterpiece. Now, it might still be rubbish in a practical sense, but actually in that narrow legal sense, it's a fantastic document. I don't recommend that you read it. Uh, but... And this is the rub, this is the weirdness, all right? For 18 months in the Brexit negotiations, the European Union said, we will not negotiate anything to do with trade in the future with you, the, Europe, the United Kingdom, until we've signed the withdrawal agreement. And we will make no special provisions with bits of the single market or elements of the customs union. You're either in the whole thing or you're out of the whole thing, okay? They negotiated the backstop. So when... Straight after checkers, we negotiated the backstop, and the first draft of the backstop applied only to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland would be in pretty much the customs union and bits of the single market, okay? Then, Theresa May went back to them and said, actually, no, I'm not going to accept that. And they made a massive concession to us, and the concession was that the backstop now applies to the whole of the United Kingdom. So the whole of the United Kingdom is within something that looks like a customs union and bound by some single market rules, which will make it a lot easier for the whole of the United Kingdom to keep trading with the, United Ki with the European Union. This is where it gets weird, okay? Theresa May came back having struck this deal and won this concession and completely forgot to mention it to anyone. She didn't try and sell this deal. That's the first weirdness. She didn't go out and say, look what I've won, everyone. This is brilliant. There was no attempt by number 10 to sell it. And then we're now in the situation where the big concession that she won that I never thought she'd get from the European Union is the thing that really annoys her own MPs. 
So she went to Brussels, she won a triumph, she's come back, and it's the, precisely the triumph that her own MPs hate. That is Brexit. I mean, so yeah, they gave us loads. The, the European Union, this is the bizarre thing about the backstop. The European Union sees the backstop as an enormous concession to the Prime Minister. The European Research Group sees the backstop as an abomination. And that's where the Prime Minister's trapped at the moment. We're now going to take a question upstairs. It's uh, four hours back, fairly central. Good evening. It's really a follow-on from your previous answer and relating to the two years negotiation period. But the Teletubbies have done a better job of negotiating than the present clowns. God, I can't stand the Teletubbies because our, our kids were of an age where it was on non-stop. So, so the very mention of it sort of brings me out in a cold sweat. No. Let me, let me say several things about this, all right? Firstly, we could have Superman or Super Wonder Woman as Prime Minister with a majority of 300, and Brexit would be really hard to do. Because Brexit is really hard to do. It's hard to do because it's a 40-year relationship that we're trying to unpick, and that's messy and it's complicated. It's hard to do because the stupidity of Article 50 gives you two years to do it, which is ridiculous. It's far too short a space of time, all right? That being said, the process hasn't been helped by the fact that we have a minority government, which always makes things messier, that both big political parties are profoundly divided over the issue, so there's no clarity from anywhere. And let's not kid ourselves. The divisions in Parliament don't come from nowhere. Parliament is a perfect representation of a state of this country. We're divided amongst ourselves. So when I say Parliament hasn't got a majority for any outcome, why? Because we haven't got a majority. If you poll the British people, which outcome do you want? Nothing wins. They split about a third or a bit under each. You, you haven't got a majority for anything. So we're divided. It's difficult. It would have been hard anyway under those circumstances. Finally, the Prime Minister hasn't handled this very well at all. And I'd say the Prime Minister doesn't handle this very well at all in this sense. My suspicion is when she became Prime Minister, she didn't really understand the EU or trade. And she laid down all these red lines without thinking. And she said, we're going to be out of the single market, we're going to be out of the customs union, we're not going to have free movement, we're not going to have the court of justice, but we're going to have frictionless trade. You can't have that combination. It is physically impossible. All right? Over time, I think over the course of the two years, that she's been on, you know, to use the sort of X factor language, a journey. All right? and has learnt that actually, if she wants to avoid a border in Northern Ireland and she wants to maintain trade with the European Union, she's going to have to make some concessions, which is what brought us to the backstop and this rather messy deal that we've struck now. But the second big mistake she made after starting off in such a sort of ardent fashion was she hasn't brought anyone with her on that journey. So rather than standing up periodically and saying, listen, what I've learned as Prime Minister is things are more complicated than I first thought they were, so I've made these concessions and changed my mind here. This is a Prime Minister who keeps saying my position remains the same as ever. It doesn't, Prime Minister. If you read what you've said along, we can see you've but she won't admit it, and she won't explain it, and she won't try and bring people along with her. So I think temperamentally our Prime Minister is, is, is just not suited to a situation where she has to persuade people to get what she wants. So she's made this a lot harder than it needed to be, I think. We've got a question on the front row, right in front of you. Uh, my question is about the last section of your talk. Looking around this lecture theatre, um, several people, me included, might not be here in 10 or 20 years' time. So could you speculate on how the electoral demographics might affect the post-Brexit political scene? <coughs> Well, you know, the, the, the common theme is young people are remainers, old people are leavers. That, there's, a, there's a huge amount of truth to that. I'm, I'm not sure it's as clear cut as most pollsters put it, partly because I have a hunch, and it's no more than a hunch because there's no evidence, that many of the young people who didn't vote in 2016 were probably more leavery than the ones who did. I suspect it's the sort of leave-minded young kids who tend not to vote rather than the remain-minded young. But anyway, that's just a theory of mine. We don't know because we don't know whether or not people become more conservative as they get older. In fact, we always assume they do. Okay, so all those kids chanting Jeremy Corbyn at Glastonbury in 15 years' time, will, be, will they be saying, I want to cut in my income tax rates? We don't know. 
Uh, but that tends to be the process that people go through historically as they get older. I think the turning point, I think most pollsters put that demographic turning point about 43, 44, when you switch from being idealistic to being a sort of Tory, uh, you know, <laughs> to put it crudely. Uh, I don't, uh, that, all right, that was, I don't know whether this generation will be the same or not. I mean, I look at my kids and I think they're weird in all sorts of ways. So maybe they'll buck the trend and actually be different to how previous generations were. But yes, there is a difference between young and old. It is a very, very marked difference between young and old. Uh, and it's more marked, I think, than it's ever been, that, that generational split. And the fact that so few young people support the Tories and so many young people support Labour is absolutely staggering. A couple of things to bear in mind. It is still the case that young people are, pr are proportionally far less likely to vote than old people. So there's far higher turnout amongst older 65s than there is amongst under 30s. And there are a hell of a lot of old... We are an old country. I mean, that's the other thing is we did some messing about with numbers on the, from the British election study after the referendum. And the calculation we came to was, if every age cohort voted the way it did, proportionally, it would have taken a turnout of 128% of under 25s to turn the referendum result. And it would have taken a turnout of 98% of under 45s. So the fact is, we're disproportionately old, and the old are disproportionately likely to vote. So you can kind of understand why young people are a bit frustrated, because they're just going to keep on losing if politics is fought along generational lines. Interesting. Uh, yes, of course, uh, L Linda Richardson's given us a whole host of questions, and, <laughs> and she's, she, but we can't go into them all. Uh, but yeah, she's wondering whether uh, the young, who in her view were overwhelmingly uh, mm -hmm. uh, wishing to remain, uh, whether their wishes uh, should not be prioritized. I don't know how you do that in a democracy, but you might have some thoughts. But she also mentions, and you might comment on this, she refers to the illegalities of the referendum mm -hmm. and why were these not, why were these ignored in Parliament? And I've heard that view from uh, other people. So you might want to comment on uh, whether in fact it was legal or not. I'm sure you've looked into that. And Ian Watson, it's slightly different strand, is there no chance of a last-minute revocation of Article 15? Let me do the second question first. Yeah, there's a chance of anything at the moment, because God knows anything's possible in our country as things stand. There's an irony about revocation, which is it is easier for us... When it comes to the European Union, it is far easier for us to revoke than to delay. If we want an extension of Article 50, the member states, 27 of them, have to unanimously vote for it. If we want to revoke, they don't get a say. Okay. Uh, I was a meeting with uh, some French politicians yesterday where I jokingly said the last thing, that the last ace up Theresa May's sleeve towards the end of March is she's going to come to you and she's going to say, give us concessions or we're going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, I reckon that'll swing it for us, you know. Uh, the problem with revocation is twofold. One, you need an act of parliament. To withdraw, you just need secondary legislation. To revoke, you need an act of parliament. And secondly, you need a majority of MPs to get that. And I don't think MPs... I think in the sort of politics we live in, the idea that MPs are going to vote down the result of a referendum without bothering to go through a second referendum is just dangerous. And I don't think they'll do it. I think they see it as just... It would just throw their legitimacy into doubt, I think. So I think it's very unlikely without a referendum. On the young... I mean, there are two ways of privileging the young. One is by like, gi giving, them, giving their votes greater weight. I think nonsense, no. I think it's just unfair. It's wrong. It's undemocratic. I'd, you know, old people... Well, we disenfranchise people who've paid tax and worked all their lives because they're old. I just don't think you can do that. And the other way of prioritizing young people... I don't want you to get the idea from these answers that I don't like young people, but is to, make, is to change the franchise. OK, let 16-year-olds vote. Now, I've got a couple of things to say about that. I, I don't ever think you should change the franchise for the next vote, because that's called cheating. OK. The, Scots, the Scottish nationalists portray themselves as great sort of liberals because they allowed 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in the referendum. That's because they polled them. And they discovered that 16- and 17-year-olds are disproportionately pro-independence. OK, this wasn't 
enlightened. This was self-interest. And that will always be the danger if you change the franchise. So I think if you're going to change the franchise, there needs to be a law that it needs to be the next vote but one, or the next vote after that. So you can't benefit from it directly. The other thing I'd say about changing the voting age is 18 makes no sense. Absolutely. But nothing makes sense. Everything is arbitrary. And unless you can give me a reason why there is an age that works, why change? Because changing is dangerous. Because it implies that you know that there's something better. And it's just, if you're moving from one arbitrary number to another, I don't understand why you would do that and why you would go through the political risks associated with it. On the illegalities, two or three things. One, many of the illegalities are claimed rather than proved as of yet dodgy links with data companies and things like that. Some of the illegalities around funding have been proven and proven in court, and that points to the fact that our electoral laws when it comes to referendums are deeply flawed. If you find spending illegalities in an election, you can rerun the election. There is no provision to do that under our law for a referendum. The final thing I'd say about our law is our laws are dreadfully 20th century for a democracy in the 21st century with the threat of online political manipulation. Now, don't get me wrong here. I personally, and this is a personal belief, don't think that the Russians changed the minds of loads of people and made them vote leave. All right, I don't think it's that simple. But I do think all democracies are vulnerable to intervention via the internet, and we need to think very, very seriously about increasing our defenses via legislation and regulation before an election really seriously does get affected by something like that. We'll come to you in a minute, but I just would like to put uh, uh, these two questions uh, to, uh, to our, Anand. And <coughs> Graeme Kerr, this is about the, uh, the union, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so he's mentioning that uh, Peter Hennessy, who was here two weeks ago with mm -hmm. William Hague, uh, said on this stage that a no-deal Brexit would, in his view, result in the eventual dissolution of the Union because of the desire of Scotland and Northern Ireland to remain in Europe. So Graham's wondering what your <coughs> view is on that. And Pat Marshall, uh, in, con in that context, was wondering whether you'd comment on the the Good Friday Agreement. We keep talking about the backstop, but uh, in the background is the, uh, the supposed risk to the Good Friday Agreement. So you might like to uh, pull those two yep. questions together. The Good Friday Agreement is a subtle and sophisticated international treaty that was meant to take essentially a two-state solution and make it look like more than that for those who didn't like the boundary. It is a, it's just a masterpiece of international treaty making and it has managed to gain consent on both bits of the island of Ireland via a constitution and it has effectively brought an end to the troubles in that country and I think it is something that should be preserved at all costs. The backstop doesn't preserve the text and the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement because it makes cross-border interaction harder than it would have been had both the UK and the Republic been in the European Union, but it preserves as much of it as you could in a situation where one is in and one is out. Uh, I don't think either side in this debate is interested in undermining or tearing up the Good Friday Agreement. There are some on the right of the Conservative Party who are, but they're not in power. I think Theresa May is genuinely concerned about the future of Ireland and the need to avoid a border in the Republic of Ireland. In fact, to such an extent, I don't think she gets enough credit for this. The Chequers plan, without going into the sordid details of the Chequers plan, the Chequers plan was basically a plan to keep us in some sort of customs and single market relationship with the European Union in goods and agriculture, okay? The logic of the Chequers plan wasn't the well-being of the British economy. 80% of our economy is services. The logic of the Chequers plan was to do anything possible to ensure that Northern Ireland had, didn't have a border with either the Republic or the rest of the United Kingdom. In a sense, what Chequers was, was the subsuming of the economic interests of the country to the greater need to preserve the unity of the United Kingdom. And I don't think Theresa May actually got credit for that. And I, I think it's slightly unfair that people accuse her of not caring about the unity of this country because she clearly does deeply. Now, what would no deal mean? Well, I've already hinted at that in what I said earlier, that the polling indicates that in case of no deal, Northern Ireland, support in Northern Ireland for unification with the Republic would go up a lot. Partly because they want to remain in Europe, more, I think, because they do not want to risk a return to the troubles with the imposition of a hard border on the island of Ireland. Scotland is fascinating. 
And Scotland is fascinating because Brexit pulls the Scots in two different directions. On the one hand, Brexit has made the believers, the members of the SNP, the sort of militants in the party, absolutely certain that this is the moment. The bloody English have done this to us against our will. They're going to make us poorer. This is the perfect moment to go for a referendum. Okay? It's confirmed everything they ever thought about the English. All right? None of which was good. Uh, I'm being slightly facetious before anyone goes away and quotes me. But at the same time, Brexit makes Scottish independence harder. And it makes it harder because if the United Kingdom were in the U European Union and Scotland were independent, both Scotland and England would be in the single market and the customs union, so there would be no need for barriers between Scotland and England. Okay? If England is outside the European Union and outside the single market and the customs union, so there would be barriers to trade between us and the European Union, and Scotland were independent and inside the European Union, those same barriers would have to be imposed on Hadrian's Wall. All right? So you've got to feel a degree of sympathy for uh, Nicola Sturgeon on this, because on the one hand, the moment is ripe. Everyone's annoyed with the English because they voted to leave, we voted to remain, this is damaging, they're Tories, we've never liked them anyway, let's go for it. On the other hand, they're aware of the fact that in a referendum campaign, this issue of the border will come out. And the majority of Scottish trade is with England, not with the European Union. So there's a holding pattern in Scottish politics at the moment. The SNP are delaying because she's bright enough to know that you should only call a referendum if you know you're going to win it. And at the moment, the polls are stuck on 55-45 against independence. But things change very, very quickly. No deal, it is impossible to know what no deal means. If no deal means, it is conceivable, not certain, not even necessarily likely. It is conceivable that you will see deaths from no deal because there might be hiccups in drugs crossing borders because of medical approval, tailbacks at borders and things like that. It is easy to imagine a situation where if stuff like that happens the headlines push public opinion very strongly in a certain... I mean, no deal is where we slightly lose control of public opinion. We just have to see what happens and hopes. And in extremists, then, you could imagine something dramatic happening in Scotland that pushes it. But at the moment, I'd be sceptical about Scottish independence for now. Thanks. And I hope uh, Ian Macpherson, who's got a fairly Scottish name, is happy that his question has uh, been answered. Uh, so we now take... Thank you for your patience. We've got a question on the mic on the right-hand side, halfway back. Although, sir, I take your point about not being able to tow the British Isles across the other side of the, the globe, mm -hmm. I'm nevertheless going to ask this question, which is about the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. The Commonwealth seems to have presented rather a low profile during recent Brexit debates. Would not post-Brexit, therefore, be an ideal time to strengthen our links with the Commonwealth, particularly as regards trade? Uh, okay, let me say, yes, we could have strengthened our links with the Commonwealth as a member state of the European Union. I mean, Germany trades an enormous amount. The reason why the German economy is slowing down now is because trading relations between Germany and China are so strong and so developed that Germany, the German economy is remarkably sensitive to the recent slowdown in consumer spending in China. So you can trade with the outside world as a nation state, under certain conditions, because there are EU rules as well, even as a member of the European Union. Yes, this would be a great moment. We need to start thinking about who else we can trade with. Don't expect the Commonwealth to do us any favors. New Zealanders and Australians have already complained about our intention to split the EU lamb tariff, lamb quota, between the UK and the EU. Because they say, but hang on, when it was an EU quota, we had a choice of 28 markets. If we split off the share that the UK had from last year's quota, then we have a large chunk of our quota that is only for one market. And what if there's an economic downturn in that market? We no longer have access with that lamb for the other 27. So they are blocking our bid to divvy up our lamb quota already. And it's a relative. It's not trivial if you're an Australian sheep farmer, obviously. But relatively small scale in terms of our economics. So they will play hardball with us. They won't give us any free passes. 
the Australians and the New Zealanders are rubbing their hands at glee, thinking this is a great moment to increase our exports to the United Kingdom. But we need to think through. If you're making trade deals, the first thing you do when you make a trade deal is you think, what sort of economy do we want in this country? Let's sign trade deals to make that easier. So here's the question. We want to trade more with the Australians. Do you want the Welsh Hill farmers in business or out of business? If you want them out of business, sign a trade deal with the Australians. They can give us lamb cheaper than the Welsh can. They do it in bulk, in a way the Welsh can only dream of. But if we take down the tariffs and remove the restrictions on Welsh lamb, on uh, New Zealand and Australian lamb, those people in the Lake District and the Welsh Hill farms will almost certainly go out of business. Or we pay them loads of money and keep them in business despite this cheap meat coming in and essentially make them like museum pieces. Okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm saying we need to make hard choices. If you think about other members of the Commonwealth, if you think about India, okay, there's two things I'd say about it. I mean, I have a position on this. You can look at me and see. There's two things I'd say about India. One, you shouldn't necessarily assume that because a country was in the Commonwealth, they're grateful to Britain for that. <laughs> All right, I'll just leave that there. There is a division, let's say, of opinion in India as to whether the empire was a good thing or a bad thing. So they're not necessarily saying, thank you, can, what can we do to help you? The second thing is, like the Australians and the New Zealanders, when it comes to signing a trade deal, the Indians will say, what are you going to give us? And I'll tell you what the Indians will ask for now because it's exactly what they asked for when the EU was trying to negotiate a trade deal with India and Britain blocked it. They blocked it because the Indian government said, we'd love to open up some of our service sectors for you. We'd like thousands more visas, please. And the British government, under because, who was Home Secretary at the time, Theresa May, uh, said no and vetoed it. And Vince Cable, who was in the coalition negotiating this deal as Business and Trade Secretary, was told to come home and not negotiate anymore. We will run into exactly those issues now. Yes, we can trade more with the Commonwealth. Yes, they will extract a price. It will be a price that will have a political cost at home. Can I just pick up on that? Mm -hmm. uh, about Australia in particular, mm -hmm. I have a slightly sad existence. I sort of look at YouTube and see all sorts of things. And I looked at... Uh, the you know your mic's on. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. Strangely, well, I was looking at the Australian High Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Uh, out of curiosity, really. And I found that there he was in a little clip signing a trade deal yeah. with Liam Fox. Mm -hmm. Now, that looked... They were shaking hands and they were not quite kissing, but they looked as if there was a great done deal mm -hmm. between Australia mm -hmm. uh, and the United Kingdom. So how does that square with uh, what you've just said? Because this is the media getting things wrong. At the moment, Liam Fox is racking up his air miles by going around the world, talking to countries that have a trade deal with the European Union, asking them if they will allow us to roll over the terms of that trade deal after we've left the European Union until we're formally out of the transition phase. Because all those 60 or 70 odd countries that have trade deals with the European Union, like Japan, and we can talk about cars later if you want, their treaty says Japan and the member states. On the 29th of March, if we leave on the 29th of March, we cease to be covered by that trade deal. So our car manuf cars manufactured here will no longer be able to enter the Japanese market as easily. And cars from here won't be able to get into the European Union as easily because it will cease to apply to us. What Liam Fox is doing is trying to achieve a rollover of, that tr of those trade deals until the moment when we have a new trade deal with the European Union. We're out of transition, in which case well, then we'll negotiate new trade deals with them. Was that, does that make so sense? It's a fake deal then? No, it's a short-term holding operation. It is not a long-term trade right. deal. Because it's got a nice big book. Well, yeah, because basically what they're doing is replicating. It, there's a big book because the EU has negotiated these trade deals with all these countries, and the big book's already been written. Right. But, of course, the Japanese are saying, actually, we're not going to replicate the same terms with the EU as with the EU, because the EU's a market of 450 million, and you're not. We'd like a few more concerns. So not everyone is playing nice. Right, I'll delete that uh, right. link. <laughs> Thank you for explaining. <laughs> and uh, we've got a question on the end of the row, halfway back in the centre. As I understand it, the um, only thing the EU has said they can change in the withdrawal agreement is the size of the font. <laughs> they will not change a thing else. If that's true, then the vote next week can only be the same vote that was taken before, and you can't have the same vote twice in the same session of Parliament. And even if you did have the same vote, I still don't see from what you said how 258 people are going to change their minds, or even half of them. Could you just enlarge on that? Yeah. Thank you. So you're right. It's about 106, seven people, ultimately, that need to change their minds on this, not 230. You're absolutely right. The EU at the moment is saying they will not reopen the withdrawal agreement. 
And you're right, I'm not, if I made it sound like I think this is a done deal, then I apologise. It's far from a done deal, and I don't know how this is going to go. Next week, the Prime Minister will almost certainly, I say almost certainly because she's off to Sharm el-Sheikh this morning, she'll see the EU leaders, there are people saying she'll come back with a deal. I don't believe that. I personally think next week the government will come back to Parliament with another motion, which they did two weeks ago. We're in a kind of Brexit Groundhog Day situation. It'll be essentially the same debate as we had two weeks ago because there will be no new deal to vote on. But what the government will say is in a few weeks' time, we'll bring back the new deal. Bear with us. Do not vote for the Cooper Amendment. Okay? When the deal comes back, what are the EU going to do? I think they're wrong to say we won't open the withdrawal agreement. I hope that it's just something they're saying. But what I do think is true is I do not see any way in which the European Union will change the substance of the backstop. And the two things that Britain wants is the unilateral right of exit they won't give us because they don't trust us. And the second thing they want is an end date. And they argue, well, it's not, if you have an end date, it's not a backstop. Okay, And they're not going to give us either of those. I think what the European Union has in mind are some warm words. We share the determination of the, European, of the United Kingdom not to use the backstop. Bear in mind, as I said earlier, they see the backstop as a concession. The French hate the backstop. They don't want us to be under the backstop for long because they think it gives us an unfair trading advantage. So they'll come up with language that says, we share the determination of the United Kingdom not to deploy the backstop. We will seek using all good faith measures. They'll do that. They'll make some noises about the indispensable role of Stormont to help sugar the pill for the DUP. Now, that's when it gets interesting. They can do one of two things. They can stick that in a letter that they lodge with the UN and say this is an international treaty like the withdrawal agreement. I personally think if you're going to do that, then why don't you just stick it in the withdrawal agreement because you could probably win 10 Tory votes just by showing that you've got that concession that they said they wouldn't give us. I kind of hope they do that because that takes Theresa May nearer the line. It is a tremendous battle. I personally think there are a large number of Conservative MPs who are looking for a fig leaf. They are looking for an excuse to vote for the deal because they don't want no deal and they don't want a referendum. And so ultimately, if they can get something that they can turn around to their constituents, those people in their inboxes, right? and say, look, I'm convinced that the Prime Minister's won something that will make a difference. If Geoffrey Cox can be persuaded to stand up and do his Gilbert O'Sullivan saying, actually, I'm convinced that this won't be forever, I suspect that even though it is all shadow boxing and pantomime, that a significant number of MPs will change their votes on the back of that. But I think opening the withdrawal agreement to use the tokenistic language rather than doing it separately is quite important. I think we've talked, we haven't talked about this particular point, but if you could very briefly yeah. comment on what Stephen ja Jackson's inquiring about. Assuming we do get a deal, and it's a PDF, yeah. Yeah. Uh, by March 29th or thereabouts, how many months or years will the negotiations about trade uh, last in the discussions of the European Union? Have you, have you looked at that and considered that? Uh, the simple answer is I don't know. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. It depends how many changes of government we have in the interim, because, you know, if we change from a Labour to a Tory government, the trade deal that a Labour government wants will be very different to the trade deal a Tory government wants. Uh, I don't see it being done within three years. I see it taking significantly longer than that, possibly up to five, because trade deals are very, very complicated and involve you going through every single bit of your economies together and deciding where you win and where you use if you sign up to certain things. Let me also say one thing that I alluded to in the talk, which is even if the deal goes through, I think we've now reached the point. If Parliament approves this deal, which it'll probably do, which if it's going to do it, it won't probably do, it'll do it in two weeks, maybe four weeks, it will be too late to pass the massive piece of legislation that also has to pass before the deal is ratified that's called the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. And that's the piece of legislation that puts the agreement we will have agreed into national law, into our national law. And until you've got both of those things, you haven't ratified the deal. It will take several weeks to pass the withdrawal agreement bill if you do it via due process, because it's three readings in the House, it's the House of Lords. I do not see how there is time to do that before the 29th of March. So it might be that we end up approving the deal asking the EU for an extension, trying to get the withdrawal agreement bill through, the House of Lords, be under no illusion, will cause all sorts of problems because they'll try and hold it up till we get to the next deadline in the hope of forcing a referendum. So we might do all this again once we've approved the deal with the implementing legislation. So there's going to be weeks of fun for us to watch in Parliament now. 
before we get anywhere near a trade negotiation. And a trade negotiation can't start till the autumn because, of course, there's European Parliament elections in May. A new European Commission will be appointed in September, October. It's only when that commission comes in that negotiations can start. We've got a question on the front row, just to my right. Professor, you spoke in an earlier answer about the neighbouring countries in particular, which will lose out if there's no deal. Mm -hmm. And we were all told during the referendum and beyond how the balance of trade is in their favour. Why do those factors seem to have helped as much in the present negotiations? Well, for several reasons. Uh, they've got a trade surplus with us, sure. Uh, it's a trade surplus that comes from 27 countries, so relatively for each individual country, it's not as big as it was made to sound. There are many countries in the European Union that don't trade very much with us at all. And that language about trade surpluses is wrong, isn't it? If, if they're not exporting to us, it's not just their exporters that lose out, it's our consumers. If they're exporting parts for cars that we make, it's our traders that suffer as well. It's a far more complicated picture than that simple, they export to us more than we export to them, and so they will lose more. That was always profoundly misleading. And even if you believe all that, what the European Union has said is, and what the member states have said, and I've been surprised that they've stuck with this line so doggedly, is we put our unity and our attachment to the principles of the single market above short-term economic pain. I'm now going to end with a series of questions. Oh, that are right. really, it's about the state of UK politics. And Great. They are, you, you touched on it quite a lot in, in, in your lecture. So, it, so forget the economics now, I think. And I'll try to... I need to read them uh, out to you. Let's just give, work towards a, an overall summing up answer. So uh, John Wilcock, will a new centrist group of MPs affect parliamentary procedure to any significant way, in any significant way, in the next few weeks. And Stephen Jackson, where will the next political leader come from uh, to take this country through all the challenges that you've mentioned? Uh, the Wilsons, that's a couple, I think. You briefly mentioned the new independence group, uh, which would likely have little impact. Is this a forerunner to a number of factional groups forming and further splitting the parties? And Dave Woodward uh, wonders what will be the future of the new independent group when the Brexit deal has been accepted. So he's wondering whether we'll end up with a Macron situation. I'm not quite sure what, quite what he's imagining there. Uh, Julie Colclough, uh, what are the chances that the change in the political situation post-Brexit will lead to a politics of greater equality in the UK? So they are all wondering about the, to some extent, about the, the people who are who are jumping out of their parties. John Sherwood <coughs> is suggesting that you are very dismissive about the opposition, uh, but how, how, is, uh, how is anyone supposed to be in opposition to a party that has continued to argue amongst itself uh, for the past several years? Uh, so he's saying, you know, what if you compare ERG with uh, Anna Subri? So he's suggesting, surely, the blame lies with the government. Now, so you might want to just sort of do a final calibration or rebalancing of your who's to blame uh, uh, comment. And just finally, uh, Philip Stenny. <laughs> Sorry, it's a lot, isn't it? Uh, but Philip, it's all in the same area. And sort Philip, of. Yeah, Philip, well, you pick, <laughs> pick the bones you like best. <laughs> and Philip Stenning wonders what might be the impact of Brexit, whether we stay in or leave, on voter turnout in the short and long term, because you mentioned that in your slides. And I do recall at the referendum itself, uh, there was a very high voter turnout. Didn't we all get very excited mm -hmm. about how many people decided to vote on this life-changing thing? And increasing turnout in 2017 as well. Yeah, so, the, so Philip's question is, um, after we've gone through all this hassle, Will the Brits all be fed up and uh, stop voting in the future, or what will happen? Well, the last question is easy, because I just don't know. Uh, I suspect, at the moment, if we had an election soon, turnout would be high again, because the people seem very exercised, and all the indicators of interest in politics are quite high at the moment. Whether that is sustainable, I don't know. I just do not know. Uh, I hope it is, actually. I think it's one of the good things that came out. I think we want a public that is engaged in, interested in, and participates in politics. Uh, 
and the situation compared to 2015 is very interesting, isn't it? You know, party political membership is up, voter turnout is up. They have to be good things. I mean, whatever you think about what politicians are doing with that, but I don't know what happens in the future. I don't like to use the language of blame particularly. I don't think either party has handled this well, and I think one of the reasons is that both parties have internal splits and so have been hampered in their attempts to deal with this well. I think Brexit matters. I don't think it's the end of the world, but I think it matters. I think it is possibly one of the most important public policy issues we've had to deal with, and frankly, I've been rather appalled by the degree to which politicians on both sides of the aisle have been willing to use it instrumentally rather than to address it head on on its merits for indirect political gain. And I think that's disappointing and I don't think that's helpful for the country as a whole. Uh, leave that one at that for the moment. Will this lead to greater equality? My head says almost certainly not. My heart says maybe, and my heart says maybe for several reasons. Uh, one of the things that the referendum did was it made us talk about stuff we hadn't talked about before, but we should have been talking about for a long time, whether it's intergenerational inequality, whether it's regional inequality, whether it's wealth inequality, whether it's the fact that, you know, we're probably going to get Crossrail 55 before they build a Trans-Pennine Railway worthy of the name. I mean, so many things that anyone who lived outside the London bubble could have told you over a cup of tea very, very easily are suddenly the subject of political debate. And I think that's a good thing. What comes of that, you know, and to the extent that we not only have Jeremy Corbyn, okay, but we have a Conservative Prime Minister who became Prime Minister with a speech about burning injustices, the just about managings, and sounded like a Christian Democrat rather than a Thatcherite Conservative, okay? So the dial has shifted rhetorically, at least, in our politics, and people are talking about this stuff. Just count the number of programmes on the radio or the telly now about the North. Yeah? And it's gone up. I mean, people are talking about the North. I mean, Stoke, you must be fed up in this area with BBC journalists. You know, who voted Remain? Oh, you're the one person who voted Remain. This is fantastic. I mean, there is a genuine interest in parts of the country that had been cr chronically overlooked. So I think in that sense, the debate is better. It's healthier. We're talking about these things all of a sudden. Uh, we have metro mayors who keep these things on the agenda far better than the North managed to do it in the past. I use the North loosely, so I, in I include you a lot for the purposes of politeness. Uh, <laughs> and so that's what gives me hope, is that it's harder now to ignore those issues. Don't get me wrong, my head says, yeah, give it a couple of years, they'll have forgotten and gone back to the same old thing. But, I, I, you know, the bottom line for me is this. If in 10 or 15 years' time, we have an economy that is smaller than it would have been had we remained in the European Union, but is significantly less unequal, then Brexit would have been a tremendous success. And I still think it's possible, but I don't think it's likely. Macron and these splits. Macron's a bad comparator, and he's a bad comparator for several reasons. Firstly, he wasn't the outsider that swept to power from nowhere. He was finance minister and the most popular politician in France when he decided to stand for the presidency. So that's a Macron myth. The second thing about Macron is he came to power at a time when the centre-right party was convulsed over a nepotism and fraud scandal and losing popularity, and when the Socialist Party, the centre-left, the equivalent of the Labour Party, was polling at 8%. The, the incumbent president, Francois Hollande, the socialist, his poll numbers were in single digits. I was polling eight points behind the French president in the French election, okay, simply because he was only on eight, right? So the opposition crumbled in France, which significantly helped Macron. Consider the parallel here. In the last general election of 2017, the combined vote share of the Conservatives and Labour Party was 82%, which is the highest it's been since 1970. So the structural situation is very, very different. Our two big parties are flourishing electorally. In France, the opposition to Macron was crumbling. In France, it's also a lot easier to run for president than it is to run for prime minister for this reason. The French presidency is done over one constituency, the whole of France. And actually, if you're a pollster, it's relatively easy to sample that population and do your focus groups and things like that. It's relatively easy and it's relatively cheap. In Britain, to win, you need to win 650 constituencies. Getting the data on 650 constituencies costs an arm 
and a leg. It is no surprise that the only person who regularly does constituency level polling in the UK is Lord Ashcroft because he's a gazillionaire. No one else could afford to do it. So there are, str and the final thing is our, our electoral system works against a new party because it pushes you to vote. You know, when the stakes are high, when you've got Corbyn versus May and there's a real ideological battle, what happens? The Lib Dems disappear. And that will continue to work. Now, what happens to this split? I don't know. It depends how many more join. If they get up into the 30s, 40s, 50s, they become a force in Parliament. Uh, they could overtake the, SD, the SNP and get their questions at PMQs. They could start to gain some profile in Parliament and disrupt the parliamentary game and be a vote changer post-Brexit on legislation because the Prime Minister still won't have a majority. Whether there'll be an electoral force thereafter, I am sceptical about, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. I don't know, to be honest. Uh, they will have an impact on parliamentary procedure if they get their numbers up because they could become the third party in Parliament. But if, they, if their numbers stay low... The other problem with this group, of course, and we saw this yesterday when Anna Soubry made her comments about how great austerity and David Cameron was, and you could imagine that Chucker and Angela Smith were there going, what? They agree on Brexit. Let's wait and see if they can find a single other policy that they agree on amongst themselves. Where are the new leaders coming from? I don't know. Uh, one of the striking things about our politics at the moment, for a variety of reasons, is both parties have got their B or C team on the front bench. All right? And if you look at the back benches, you look at the quality of the people who chair the select committees in Parliament, whether it's Nicky Morgan or Rachel Reeve or Tom Tugendhat, or the people who impress me, and I understand this is personal, are nowhere near the front benches because they've fallen out with the leadership. Uh, how that changes, I don't know. What I will tell you is this. The next Tory leader, if that leadership election happens in the next few months, is going to be significantly Brexiteer than the current incumbent because of that electorate of the Tory membership. Uh, and so, you know, you can sort of think about the candidates now, but it's not inconceivable that someone who is a hard Brexiter of ERG type wins if they can get through to the second round via the MPs. I don't think our politics sorts itself out for a decade, to be honest. I think the combination of the Brexit blame game, the structure of the parties, the fact that to an extent the militants have taken over these parties and put the parties at odds with their electorates is going to take an awfully long time to wear, sort of wear itself through, if you like. So, I mean, I study politics. I think it's fantastic. It's really interesting. But actually, if you're after stability and predictability and reliability from our politics, then just hibernate for 10 years and come back and... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you remember, but I think it was before the referendum, there were people going around saying, don't trust experts. Was it Michael <laughs> Gove? He got <laughs> some comments. Yes, well, I think tonight we've had uh, an excellent demonstration that he was profoundly wrong. Uh, we've had uh, a brilliant presentation uh, by uh, Professor Menon and a very wide-ranging Q&A. I'm sure that you could come up with an hour more of questions about Brexit, but I think anyone interested in this subject will be hugely satisfied by tonight, and I hope you will leave reflecting on many of the wise words we've had tonight from Professor Anand Menon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you.